Hello everyone, my name is Renee Hancock and I'm the CEO of the Les Twentyman Foundation. It's great that you can join us for this conversation during Book Week, which is a special opportunity to celebrate Australian authors and books. I'm delighted to be talking with Alice Pung, who is an ambassador of the Les Twentyman Foundation and an award-winning writer, journalist and essayist. Alice is also a lawyer and she's very passionate about promoting literacy and literature among young people. Alice often speaks to the young people in our programs, but given social distancing at the moment, we can't do this face to face. So we're bringing you this conversation online. Alice, welcome. Tell us about how you found your love of writing. Hi everyone. Thank you for having me as your invited author. I found my love of writing growing up in Braybrook. So as some of you know, I'm a Braybrook girl and I was born in Footscray in the Western General Hospital. And when I was growing up in Braybrook in the 1980s, there weren't many books. Well, there weren't any books about people living in the Western suburbs like us, you know, <laughs> any books um, about young people, teenagers in particular. And so the, I, I was a big bookworm. I read a lot of books. And um, when I was about 19 years old, when I was doing an um, assignment at university, it was a creative writing assignment. You had to take stories from your own life and write about them. And um, I was in this class at the university where a lot of the members of the class had traveled overseas many times. They were from the other side of the river. So they'd gone to private schools, they'd been to Europe by the time they were 16. There were some really fascinating older members of that class, one woman who had children, another man who joined the Labour Party. And so everyone seemed to have interesting stories to tell except me. So I started writing this story about, well, about going to kindergarten. I went to a kindergarten called Cherry Crescent, just in Braybrook. And I just remember, um, I didn't speak English when I first went to school. So my grandmother used to bundle me up in lots of clothes until my hands stuck out like a penguin's. And I just remember going to kindergarten in this really hot day, bundled up in this big padded mouse suit. And um, I, I couldn't speak English properly because we spoke Chinese at home. And I just remember being so embarrassed to speak English that I peed my pants and uh, it was photo day. And the photographer came and he took photos of everyone, you know, little kids at the easel with their paintbrushes, kids on the swings, kids in the sandpit. And then when it was time for the kids to have their slide photos taken, so every kid went down the slide and he did an action shot, I wouldn't go down the slide because I knew if I went down the slide, it would leave a big wet streak and people would know I'd peed my pants, you know, even underneath all those layers of clothes, the pee would seep through. So um, stupidly, I thought, well, I've got nothing to lose. The night before this assignment was due, I wrote this story about peeing my pants in kindergarten. And um, at, when it was time to present that week, you know, I read my story out and these are serious you know, <laughs> people in the class, serious writers, they were all very quiet. And I thought, oh crap, you yeah, know, I've done something terrible. No, no one's reacting to this. And in fact, one girl even started laughing and I, I felt really embarrassed. And then um, the girl who started laughing, when the teacher said, okay, anyone have comments on Alice's story? She put her hand up and she said, this story is fabulous. I loved it because, you know, university students, they write about serious things. They write about, you know, going drinking. They write about death. They write about drugs. And she said, this is the first time I've read a story in class that's made me laugh. It's pretty funny. You capture the, the child's voice so well and um, you show us a part of life we've never seen before. Not peeing your pants, because that's completely universal. But coming from this Chinese-Cambodian family and starting school without a single word of English. And so that's how I got into writing, and that's how I found my writing voice. Um, I wanted to have this particular blend of the universal stories that everyone could relate to, you know, being embarrassed as a child, being angry at your parents, feeling like you've got your freedoms restricted, and also the very specific, what it's like to grow up 
in a um, you know low socioeconomic household in the western suburbs of Melbourne from a refugee family. So I think it's those two elements, the very specific and the universal, uh, that made me have the writing voice that I have today. Many of the young people that we work with will be reading your book, Unpolished Gem, right now. It's on the Australian education curriculum. What do you want young people to take away from this book? It's um, next year will be its 15th year. So the book is quite old, you know, and some of the students studying the book would probably be as old as the book or sometimes even younger. And um, what do I want people to take away from this book? You know, as a writer, I don't have any specific message. Um, and that, that sounds contrary to what I do as a writer because writers write messages. <laughs> but I've never been the sort of writer to go, oh, I'm going to write a book about this and teach people a lesson about anti-racism. I'm going to write a book about that and teach people about the dangers of drugs because teenagers are smart. When I was a teenager, the books that I hated the most were the ones that really um, were not books. They were teaching tools. They had a very specific message. The adult, the adult author had this idea in mind that they would be there to teach a lesson to young people. And because they were so much older and wiser, they would impart all this wisdom that they knew. And those were the most boring books. Um, they didn't have the nuances or the flaws of character and personality that you see in true novels that, um, that have an actual heartbeat. And I was very lucky. I started writing Unpolished Gem when I was 19 years old. So I was still a teenager myself. And I started writing this book because I had a lot of self-doubt. I never saw anyone that looked like me in the books I read, except for Claudia in the Babysitter's Club. Um, I never knew what it was like to navigate my teens and 20s as an Asian Australian person. So I set out to, with a question, you know, <laughs> what's it like growing up Asian in Australia at the particular time I grew up? And I set about writing to see if I could find an answer to this question. And that's why Unpolished Gem, um, it's like quite painfully honest at times about my experiences. And that's why at the time it was published, it did so well. Um, I think because it subverted some stereotypes people had about refugee families, about Asian immigrants, and especially about the children of pushy tiger parents. So um, my mum can't read or write, so she, she couldn't be a pushy tiger parent. She couldn't educate me. And what's more, when my book came out all those years ago, I remember at the book launch, um, my dad invited all his friends. Some of them worked in factories. Some of them had small businesses in Footscray, but they all came with their kids. And some of them had teenage children and they bought the book for their kids. And they pushed their kids next to me to take a photograph and their kids would be kind of pissed off holding the book thinking, oh, why do I have to read this? Dad's gonna make me read it. And I understood exactly how they felt because on the back of Unpolished Gem, uh, where, where the blurb is, it says something about the author. And on the back of the blurb, it says, Alice Pung is a Melbourne writer and lawyer based, you know, born in Footscray. Now, those parents who couldn't read or write a single word of English in our very small insular community in Footscray, they found out that I had um, I'd gone to university and studied law. So they thought, wow, this, this lawyer wrote a book. So this book must be about how to make it for our kids, you know, the, the great immigrant success story. So they wanted to buy this book for their kids to teach them a lesson about perseverance and about, you know, resilience and about really working hard and making it. And of course, for those of you who have read Unpolished Gem, you know, it doesn't work out that way. I, I um, actually document in the last few chapters my year 12, and my year 12 was a horrible year. You know, my mum got severely depressed and um, got very sick. I had to look after my younger siblings. And eventually, 10 weeks before my exams, I had a nervous breakdown, a, a breakdown so severe that I wasn't eating, sleeping, or doing anything much. I was almost like a, um, in a vegetative state. I s spent a lot of time staring at the wall and, you know, doing nothing <laughs> if you've ever been that severely depressed. Now, that's not the narrative that you read in the great Australian dream novels, but that was the honest narrative. Um, 
And eventually I got out of it, of course, but the, the whole book is filled with, um, with honest truths like that, because it's not easy. It's not easy being a child of immigrants and a child of refugees. It's not easy to grow up in a racist environment and neighborhood as I did at that time. And it's not easy to um, wrap your life up in a very neat and succinct story of success. In fact, the greatest lesson I learnt through all that was how to fail and how to fail gracefully. So I hope students will get something out of Unpolished Gem, if, if only that. Tell us about your most recent book, Close to Home. It's a collection of your most loved writings. Which, which piece of work is your favourite and why? It's called Close to Home because it's set, most of the stories are set, you know, um, well, in Braybrook or Footscray. I've been all over the world as an author. I've been to Alaska, in far-flung places like that. I've been, you know, to Europe when my book got translated into Italian. And I've been to um, lots of parts of Asia to, to visit schools and give talks. But one of the most wonderful things I've discovered as an author was when I was in Alaska, I found my book Unpolished Gem there. And I thought, wow. Footscray has reached the wilderness of Alaska in the middle of this winter where the sun only shone maybe six hours a day. There was a little slice of Footscray in this tiny bookstore on the other side of the world. And so I guess the collection of essays in Close to Home is, um, is just about that. It's about the little Saigon market in Footscray before it burnt down. It's about, um, you know, some racist idiot leaving a note on our car window for me and my husband to find, which said in very big letters, stop race mixing. And it's about growing up in Braybrook uh, with friends who were never really given a real opportunity to see what life was like on the other side of the river, not due to their own hard effort or perseverance, because some of the most hardworking people I know lived in Braybrook, but just due to bad luck and poor circumstances. So that's what Close to Home is about. Do I have a favourite essay in there? It's hard when the essays, um, you know, span a course of 15 years. Uh, I guess one of my favourites is when me and my best friend went back to visit another friend who hadn't really moved very far from Braybrook and who'd had one or two children by then, I can't remember, and who was, um, who was trapped at home because she didn't have a car. And I just realised you know, um, it wasn't through people's efforts or circumstances that kept them trapped. It, it was just bad luck. And so I think that was one of my favourite essays, but it changes through through the months and things like that. So that, that's an excellent question. Alice, you've always had such a great sense of humour that comes through in your writing. How does humour help you to connect to your audience? So about a sense of humour when writing, or even a sense of humour through life. I think I get that through my dad, because my dad survived this terrible genocide, the killing fields of Cambodia, where he had to bury most of our loved ones. In fact, that was one of his jobs, was to bury dead people. And um, he survived four years as a slave labourer. Now, we probably think about slavery as something that happened in, you know, Southern America hundreds of years ago to black African Americans or something way in the past. But there's modern day slavery. And in 1975, Cambodia was a slave nation in that the government made every single member of the country its slaves. And um, so my dad was a slave laborer for four years. And if you've ever seen that movie, 12 Years a Slave, You'll know exactly what he went through. And my dad maintained this sense of humour. And he liked to tell funny stories, which I thought were embarrassing when I was a kid. I just remember being 14 years old and my friend Bianca coming over. And um, my dad was eating calamari. And he would say, oh, Bianca, this calamari is delicious. But it's not as tasty as that belt I ate. And um, I was so embarrassed. I thought, Dad... No one eats a belt. And I told him that. And I was thinking in my head, oh, my dad, he can't even speak English properly. You know, <laughs> how can you get a belt mixed up? Maybe he ate a belt of licorice or a belt of beef jerky. Now, this is a tragic thing. 
that racism does to you, it makes you critical about the people you love most. So I thought my dad just didn't know English properly. You know, I said, Dad, no one eats a belt. Did you eat a belt of licorice this morning or something? And my dad said, don't interrupt me. I ate a belt. And my mum said, yeah, your dad, when he was surviving those killing fields in Cambodia, he, did you know he was so skinny that if he breathed inwards, you could feel his backbone through his stomach? So even though my mother can't read or write, I come from a very literary family. They have this great way with words. You know, it's, it's a perfect metaphor. It's not even metaphor. It was literal. You could feel his backbone through his stomach when he was starving. So what ha actually happened was my father found this belt, you know, the belt you wear around your waist um, that he had buried ages ago because you're not allowed to own anything in this revolution. Even if you picked up a handful of sand, you could be executed for stealing from the country. So anyhow, I picked up this, got his old belt, and he thought, oh, gosh, we're starving. We haven't had anything to eat. People were, you know, if people dug in the ground and a big fat tarantula spider popped out, that was protein that day. And my dad couldn't even find any spiders, silkworms, crickets, rats. There's no food except for this belt. And he looked at it and he thought, hey, this comes from the skin of an animal. You know, people eat beef, jerky and pork crackling. So he cut it into tiny, tiny pieces. And then he called my grandmother and my auntie over, who were the only two members of his family who were, he knew for certain were alive at that time. And he said, here, taste this, after he boiled this belt into mush. You know, it's still leathery. And um, my granny said, son, you found meat. How wonderful. And my auntie just shoved it in her mouth and chewed and chewed and she said oh brother it's great you found meat but how long is this what, what kind of animal is this and how long has it been dead for and my father said oh don't ask any questions just eat it and that's what kept them alive for the next day or so you know these pieces of belt expanding in their stomachs and um when my dad told Bianca this story it, it was um I was kind of embarrassed because you know when we went to school in Braybrook people were calling us ching chongs and saying that we ate dogs and ate crappy you know discussed dogs and cats in the dim sim so I thought oh my dad's only confirming their prejudices but my best friend Bianca she looked at my father in absolute awe and she said I can't believe you ate a belt and my dad said yeah funny isn't it you know when you're starving you'll eat anything <laughs> And I walked Bianca home that afternoon and I said, Bianca, don't tell anyone this story at school. And she said, your dad's an absolute legend. You know, I can't believe he survived such terrible things. And he's so funny. He told such a funny story. Just wait till we tell the, tell the kids at school. You know, they'll love it. It's such a great story. But I knew <laughs> um, that that story wouldn't translate well. You know, you, you tell it the other kids, they're not going to think, what is this legendary man? you know how amazing is that that he found a way to survive starvation they're just going to think oh those chinese they eat anything they eat cats and dogs so Sabirka, please don't tell anyone this story <laughs> and it was only as an adult that i realized what a wonderful story it was and it made it into one of my books my second book called her father's daughter and um humor is so important to me because Otherwise, you don't survive. You don't survive terrible things. I just remember being a kid in Braybrook, eight years old. Some idiot chucked a rock through our window, you know, and um, they, they didn't like us being around. They thought we were Asians stealing jobs. So some teenagers or hooligans chucked a rock through our front window. We lived in a house down Joy Street. It was a former commission house. And my father came home from work and just sticky taped that window up and said, oh, that's all right, you know, we'll just lower the blinds and we'll have a bit more privacy. And he didn't get that window fixed for 10 years <laughs> until we sold the house. And as a kid, I thought, Dad, what a cheapskate, he won't even fix the window. But as an adult, I realized he did it to protect us because if he got that window fixed the next day, someone else would feel tempted to chuck another rock in. Um, so he always taught us to keep our heads down low, study hard and, you know, do, do the best we could. Tell us about growing up in Braybrook. What was high school like for you? I, I loved growing up in Braybrook uh, only because wonderful people, and this is how I'm connected to the Les Twentyman Foundation, people like Les Twentyman and his social workers 
were working around the clock and behind the shadows to make sure that all the kids in Braybrook had a really decent childhood. And it was only when I was an adult that I realised what that childhood meant. So I went to a school called Tottenham North Primary, which is now Dinjira Primary School. And every month, the Western Bulldogs footballers, who were great towering men, they were like giants. They won tally. They were, you know, it was like seeing your heroes. Um, I didn't watch much football and footballers weren't my heroes. But some of the kids in school, you know, some of the boys, it was like they saw their heroes when these footballers marched into the school. What I loved about these footballers was every month, they would come and they'd give us breakfast. They'd bring all this cereal, their sausages, bread, and they'd just um, give us breakfast for free. <laughs> so that was my highlight every month. You could go to school and get this great breakfast served to you by these great towering footballers. And I thought, man, we were so lucky as kids. You know, no other school gets this special treatment. That's so terrific. And then I realized as an adult that Braybrook was one of the poorest areas in Melbourne. And because it was one of the poorest, a lot of kids, especially a lot of friends who never talked about it, never said a single word, never said that they didn't have breakfast at home. They got to have breakfast, a proper hot cooked breakfast once a month. And um, I didn't realize the extent of disadvantage. In fact, I just remember being in primary school and this is a really nasty thing, but we used to make fun of kids who would... Uh, rummage in the rubbish bins to look for food we call them bin scabs so if if there was half a donut if you're really lucky no one chucks half a donut in the bin but if if there was they'd just grab it out of the bin and they dust it off and eat it and um you know they'd find scraps of sandwiches and we called them bin bin scabs you know that they were kids that just did that and those kids they were tough and and i thought Looking back now, I thought, man, those kids, I, I really have admiration for them because instead of, um, you know, some of them shrunk away because they're embarrassed, but some of them were quite proud of their bin rummaging habits. <laughs> they would find food and then they'd, they'd proudly um, eat it and, and they would be proud that they were less hygienic than most kids, that they were tough, they were slightly feral. So I, I have good memories. I also have some bad memories, of course, because my brother and I, early on, were the first Asian kids at school and we got teased a bit. And um, some of the kids who didn't know any better called us Ching Chongs and also called us this um, pretty clever insult. They called us PowerPoints. You know the PowerPoint that you plug your iPhone or your Samsung Galaxy into at night? You know, it's got two lines going down and one line in the middle. The, the PowerPoint socket. So they used to say, oh, that looks like your face has got two lines going down. So that was um, that was a bit unpleasant. And um, high school was, I, I went to a high school in Braybrook. In fact, I went to five different high schools, but my favorite high school was uh, Christ the King College, just down Churchill Avenue in Braybrook. And that was a very small school. It still is. Um, you know, it had a bunch of nuns living there at that time as well. So it was surrounded by a carpet factory and it was surrounded by housing commission houses. It was this little protected little school that seemed quite safe. Um, walking home from school was a bit unsafe because I just remember a carload of men one day who were about older than my dad driving past. And I, was, I was a school kid, you know, <laughs> was in my uniform and everything and they were honking at me and yelling out some pretty nasty stuff um, like me love you long time which is from a movie called full metal jacket uh, and it's it's a line that a vietnamese prostitute says to some american gi soldiers so it wasn't a pleasant thing so that was the 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 oh, what do you call it the you know the the growing up in braybrook you've got equal measures of love and and empathy and kindness from your teachers in the school. And then when you step outside the classroom, you've got footballers serving you breakfast, you've got multiculturalism going on, you've got, you know, book day parades. School was wonderful. You step outside of the school, you walk down the streets and they're literally quite dangerous. You know, cars honk at you and, and grown men shout things out that they'd never yell out to their own daughters. So that was the dichotomy, the, the balance that 
that was um, this interesting neighbourhood called Braybrook at that time. How has the pandemic impacted your life and your family? Has it made you look at your writing differently? Um, the pandemic has been, uh, you know, it's affected everyone. But I think I've been very lucky because I, I work as a writer. And as you know, writers are quite solitary. So not much has changed about my writing. I still when before the pandemic, I still wrote at home. I also have another job. So I work as a lawyer as well at the Fair Work Commission. And um, the pandemic affected our lives actually in a positive way for office workers because we're all sent home to work from home. And when you work for a place like the Fair Work Commission, uh, they, they send you a laptop home with you so you can do your work. So everything's provided for. And it was just so much easier. And I got to spend time with my family because I have two sons. And um, you might not be able to tell from this video, but I'm nine months pregnant. So during this whole pandemic, I've been growing a baby. And it, the best place to grow a baby is not when you're running around, dropping your kids off at childcare and, you know, picking them up and dropping them off at school. It's just being safe at home with, with all your loved ones around. So I've been very lucky through this pandemic. Uh, and being a writer, of course, I visit a lot of schools. So during this pandemic, uh, I haven't had to travel very far to go to distant schools in the countryside, in Newcastle, you know, even halfway across Australia. We've just been able to do these sessions on Zoom or like I'm doing for you now during book week over online. So the pandemic has been good for people who have quite sedentary jobs. Sedentary just means sitting down jobs. It's been very difficult for the other half of my family who um, who are labourers, who my uncle, the brick bricklayer, doesn't have much work. A lot of my family are aged care workers, so they are put in this dangerous situation where they have to go to work and risk catching the virus, but they're essential. They're, they're just really good people. And my sister is a school teacher. So yeah, so it's affected people in different ways. But being a writer, I've been very lucky during this pandemic. Has it made me see my writing differently? Oh, I've been more productive just because I've had more time to think. So I finished writing a children's book with my friend Cheryl, who's an illustrator. I finished a young adult book. Um, it's not made me see writing differently. I guess it's made me see life differently because uh, I moved in for a bit with my parents just because, you know, I've been pregnant and having two kids. And when you move back in with your parents as an adult, you start to see them differently. And they gave me a lot of perspective. You know, I mentioned they survived war, famine, the murders of half our family. And they said, this is a piece of cake. All these whinges on television, and, you know, in the newspaper saying this is the most difficult thing they've ever lived through. My parents said, look, the, these Australians, they might have lost their jobs, but some of them are sitting at home and they're watching Netflix and they're safe. No one is bombing them. They don't need to grab a gun at the age of 14 and go and fight in a military combat zone. You know, <laughs> there's some kind of perspective there that my parents have that I wouldn't have had if I hadn't spent a lot of time with them. So I've been very lucky uh, to have the background I do have. And I know that most of you, um, young adults in the Les Twentyman Foundation, you will have a lot more perspective than some other kids, where to them, this is a worst, absolute, most terrible thing to have happened to them. And I think you've seen worse, many of you. So I think your resilience is uh, quite high during this pandemic. Um, but I do understand that life is hard for some of you, especially when you've been forcibly locked down. So Yes, I, I, I feel your struggles as well. What advice do you have for students who are completing their VCE right now? You're going through VCE at a very unusual and difficult time. So you're not amongst your classmates. And from the Zoom sessions I've done with certain schools, students are finding it a lot harder, especially students, um, you know, from backgrounds like mine where you're at home and you're probably one of many children. I was the oldest of four kids. 
and you're locked down and your parents don't speak or write much English. So you're not only responsible for doing your VCE, you're responsible for teaching your younger brothers and sisters, for administering their Zoom sessions, sometimes even feeding and caring for them, taking them on walks, getting them out of your parents' hair while your parents go to work. So when you've been locked down, your responsibilities are immense. You're not just sitting there studying for VCE. You've got housework, you've got family work, you've got teaching work. Um, and I understand those struggles because they're exactly what I went through when I did VCE. And um, it's all part of being, it's all part of being a family, but it's also part of being, uh, you know, immigrant household. It's all part of being someone from Braybrook or Footscray or St. Albans or Sunshine. The struggles we have are very different from the struggles of people who all they have to do is study for VCE and they're very stressed. I think because you have so much going on, you'll probably have a lot more perspective as well. And you can only try your best. And the best advice I can give you is, if you've done your absolute best this year, if you've managed to fit your study in amongst all the other things you've had to do, if you've managed to consistently, you know, try, do your homework or be on as many Zoom sessions as you can, you'll, you'll be all right. And you know, VC is not the be all and end all. Um, and, and that's, I know this from experience because I had a nervous breakdown in year 12. I think the teachers didn't even think I could sit my exams. I was that far gone. I couldn't even read a newspaper straight. The sentences made no sense. You know, I was so close from being hospitalized. But my mum drove me to all my exams and she said, you've just got to get through them. You've just got to do it. I don't care if you write gibberish, just do it. So that's what I did. And because I'd been consistent that whole year, um, I tried to fit study in whenever I could. All the stuff you learn is in the back of your head. If you've, if you've, you know, <laughs> if you've studied hard enough, even if you have a breakdown, and I, I seriously would not have believed this until I experienced it myself, it's all there. So I sat through my exams and I thought I wrote gibberish. I have no idea about a single sentence or word I wrote in any exam. And I came out of those exams thinking I'd failed and I'd just spend the rest of my life maybe selling mobile phones in Footscray or something. And then um, my VC results came through because back then you had to call up and I called up and I thought someone was playing a sick joke on me. I really didn't think I got the mark I did, but I actually did. I, I got um, quite a good mark. I got a, a mark that was enough to get me into Melbourne Law School, which was completely unexpected, you know. I, um, I'm not the brightest person, I'm not the dumbest person in the room, but I wasn't the smartest kid in school. I just tried really hard. And I guess your teachers are all going to tell you this, but, you know, just persevere and you'll get there. And, you know, I think that having to look after three younger siblings and take care of my sick mum, actually gave me more determination <laughs> to actually do well in year 12 than people who had all day to study and sat around and, and their mind got up to mischief and they thought about what parties they could go to and, you know, they had parents who went to university. They took that stuff for granted, but I could never take any of that for granted. And I know a lot of you won't be able to as well. So all the best with your year 12 this year. It's a real pleasure to talk to year 12 students in, in the Western suburbs because I can really, you know, <laughs> really relate to your struggles. Alice, our audience might be interested to know how you came to be involved with the Les Twentyman Foundation. Can you tell us a little bit about that? I got involved in the Les Twentyman Foundation even before I realised I was involved in it. As I mentioned, I was probably a recipient of the many kind things that this foundation did for our primary schools and our high schools. And um, I officially got involved because I was writing a story many years ago about um, this interesting place in Footscray. It was a place that was above you know, near my dad's shop. My dad had a small retrovision store back then and it was near my dad's shop. He had to go up a secret stair and up there were all these books that kids could take for free if they couldn't afford school books. It was, of course, Les's back to school program. But what was so fascinating about it was that 
it was right next it was in actually in the same room as a methadone clinic which is where people go to um get you know doses of medication to help them recover from their um drug addiction so i would sit there and watch and there would be people lying on the couch just um passed out because they had their shots administered by the doctor in this clinic just lying on the couch and all around them were these high school students who came up to get their books you know to get their free books their free textbooks and some of them were related to the people who were lying there passed out um who were you know, who were dependent on on drugs um and so I, I looked at these, you know, this 16 year old boy still in his school uniform with his tie loosened. Then you see his dad lying on the couch and you think, wow, th this is, um, this is what life is like. <laughs> you know, There's such resilience in a suburb that these parents are trying to get better. And so are these students. And so I wrote this article because Richard Tregear, the social worker was the one who, who took me up and you know, we became very good friends. And he actually showed me a very special table that was right next to the books. And it was a table where there would have been at least 20 photographs of um, beautiful, beautiful young men and women of all, you know, all ethnicities. Um, and they, they were people who had passed away from the, the heroin trade in Footscray at that time. They were young people who had just died. And I, I found it really sad. Uh, and I found it beautiful that there were candles lit around this table. And so that, that was my experience of the Les Twentyman Foundation. It's a very special organization. At the time I grew up in the 80s and 90s, people like us, Southeast Asian refugees, were the worst members of society. You know, when you turn on the tally and you hear about African gangs, which is so racist. Well, we were the gangs back then, we're the Southeast Asian gangs. And to have a foundation that was so, um, so anti-racist that they didn't care if you were Vietnamese or Sudanese or Muslim or Tongan, that they cared for you all equally and that they mourned your loss or the loss of your sibling or the loss of your sister or your child equally. Uh, it just, you know, <laughs> it made me um, realize that th this is a very humble and a very ground up organization. So when Les told me that he would like me to be an ambassador of the Les Twentyman Foundation quite a few years ago. Of course, I said yes. I, I was proud, proud to be from Braybrook, proud to be associated with the 20th Man Fund, and just really proud to be involved in speaking to you all today. What advice would you give to a young person who is dreaming of becoming a writer one day? The advice um, I would give you, this is very important, is that often young people, especially from our background, think that we don't have re really, you know, our stories aren't that interesting. <laughs> so when I was younger, I used to set my stories in New York or London or big cities, or I used to write about vampires. I used to write about people who never looked like me. They would always be, you know, blue eyed or brown haired or th they wouldn't be Asian. They'd be white people because I thought those were the, the heroes of the stories. And until I started to center my characters in the Western suburbs, my stories had no heartbeat. They were just cliches. They were just gleaned from newspaper articles I read or from stories I'd, you know, pinched from, <laughs> like the Hunger Games that you have now. Back then it was vampire stories. So they were not truly original. Your only truly original stories come from within and they have an emotional heartbeat. And the best stories that have emotional heartbeats come from your own life. Your own life that you don't find that fascinating is definitely going to be fascinating for people who don't live the lives we do. And so that's why it's so important to me as a writer from the Western suburbs to cultivate other voices from the Western suburbs as well, because um, I, I know the Australian publishing industry. Most people who write have two things that people in the Western suburbs don't have. They have time on their hands, they have a lot of time. To, to spend writing, lighting candles, you know, making their office space beautiful so they can write. Uh, you grow up in a, a working class family, you don't have much time. You're busy helping your parents, <laughs> that kind of thing. 
And the other thing most people have, uh, which makes writing very middle class, is they have enough money to buy them time. So they go on writer's retreats. They can take a whole year off their lives or off university to work on a book. You know, you'll be glad to know I've never been able to do that. I've never taken time off a whole year to finish a book or anything like that. The most I've ever taken is two weeks of annual leave. <laughs> I still have a day job. I still have a family to care for. <laughs> I still have other things to do. I've never been a full-time writer. And yet it's these things, these lacks, you know, if you don't have enough money, you don't have enough time that propel your writing. It makes you more determined to get that writing done. So don't think that there'll be a perfect time to write when you're old enough to earn earn enough money to buy yourself time or you know <laughs> or or when you um, are smart enough or when you know enough words because I started writing Unpolished Gem when I was 19 I was a teenager still and you can start writing this very day in fact during this pandemic is the best time to write we're all under lockdown we're all spending a lot of time at home and we all um, are going to have more interesting thoughts than we otherwise would have so thank you so much for inviting me to be your author during this book week. It's been a real pleasure to talk to you all. I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person and meet you all, but I hope you have a wonderful year. And for those of you who are doing VCE, I wish you all the very best of luck. Thank you. A big, big thank you to Alice for taking the time to speak with us today. We really appreciate her ongoing support and look forward to seeing what the future brings uh, and wish her all the best with her young and growing family.